Happy Friday afternoon, everybody. I know I'm standing between you and the weekend, so we'll uh, we'll get through the stuff and get done. But I thought I'd update you and let you know how I spend my my afternoons before this class. Okay. So uh, in case you guys are missing out on this, you know, some of you were live and got to see this, but uh, let's see. I think this is the I think this is the uh, before photo. All right. So this is me. Okay. This is me. Everybody's looking there. All right. All right. Yeah, let's uh let's go ahead and take a look at the after photo. Oh but I raised money for a good cause, so I feel good about it. You know, so I always worked. There was a DSP, was it uh it gives new new meaning to Delta Sigma Pi? Is that was the joke? Yeah, yeah, it was the joke. Yeah, all right. What was it officially called? Pi the professor or something? Yeah. Pi the professor. Nice. All right. So yeah, yeah, we, we missed out on that. It lives forever in uh, Dr. Caden's phone, who shared the, shared the images with me. Yeah. So that's that's the stuff that before we get to talking about homework. So yeah, just a reminder: uh, exam next week, study guide, and practice exam are posted on Brightspace. Finish the practice exam before Monday. All right, defeats the purpose if you come in and die, haven't gone over any of this because you won't know what you do know when you don't know. That's why we actually spend the time going through it. That's why I give a full day devoted to reviewing for this, because I want you guys to be prepared for the exam. So please make sure you do that for me. All right. Let's talk now about um, let's talk about now about homework. Okay. So unfortunately, I forgot to make a uh, a randomized list. So I'm just going to go in alphabetical order. Okay. I'm just going alphabetical order. I'll try not to do that too often, but I was busy before class doing something, you know, and distracted me, you know, so I'm not going to talk about what that was at all, but uh, yeah. Um, so 517, which of the following procedures would an auditor most likely rely on to verify management assertions of completeness? All right. So before I call on Juliet, because she's first in the list, uh, what are we talking about? We talk about completeness. What direction are we moving? Um, bottom to top because it's tracing okay so moving bottom to top so that's what we're looking for we're looking for uh, uh, tracing so that's what we're looking for something that basically starts with our source documents and moves to what's been recorded moves up the chain all right so if that's the case uh which one of these would be the most accurate or appropriate do you think juliet I'm, I'll, I'll stop since you don't have the document open. We'll go ahead and jump in. All right. So we're moving from source document up the chain. That doesn't necessarily need to be what's recorded, but it can be to a later source document. So it can be later in the process. All right. So let's just talk about B real quick. Up, oh, it is B. Yeah. <laughs> Why is it B? Okay. So what happens first? Do we receive the goods or, do, or sorry, do we ship the goods out to the customer or do we send the invoice? or our client should say, because we're talking about the client processes. Do they ship the goods out to the customer or do they bill them? Which occurs first? Everybody should know this, so it doesn't have to be isolated to Juliet. Billing. So what, the billing occurs first? No, they no. send the invoice and you got to pay them and then you ship stuff. No, it goes all the way around. <laughs> so ship the goods out to the customer, say you owe us money, and then we're going to send you the invoice, okay? So with respect to the process, we ship the goods, and then we move to uh, the billing stage, all right? That was the revenue cycle, which we'll refer to back when we talk about that a little bit more detail in this course. But that's kind of so what we talked about in AIS. So that's going to be moving from one stage of the process to a later stage. So we're moving up the process, all right? And that's going to be more of a bottom to top uh, sequence, all right? So that would be why B is. So it's a challenge uh, to make sure that we recognize what direction we're moving. And that being the case, we move down to 518. It says testing the existence assertion for an asset. The auditor ordinarily works from the what? So if com uh, completeness is bottom to top, that means existence occurrence is what direction? Top to bottom. Okay. So we're going from record to source. All right. If that's the case, then uh, Nick, what is going to be our answer for uh, 518? C. C. So accounting records. To the supporting documents. So that sounds like record to source. That's it uses the word record and then talks about source documents. And C is indeed the answer for that logic right there. Very good. All right. In which of the following types or which of the following types of audit evidence is least reliable? Let's go ahead and redo our do our hierarchy. So remember, auditor generated evidence is at the top, client reliant evidence is at the bottom, and the middle is basically internal evidence. The mnemonic that Becker uses, which is really clever, A-E-I-O-U, auditor evidence, external evidence, internal evidence, oral evidence, okay? So which of these is least reliable? Now, they didn't give you an easy one here because they didn't ask you about observation or inquiry, so you had to actually pick through this. So if that's the case, Matt, what do you think is the answer? 
Uh, so test counts performed by the auditor. That would be the most reliable. That would be the most reliable because we're talking about something the auditor is doing themselves. All right. But let's let's look at each of these individually. Okay. So that's an that's an auditor generated evidence. What about B? Bank statements came from the entity. That's something that's uh something that's generated by the entity but given from a so uh, external source. That would be a combination of external internal. Let's look at D. Correspondence from the entity's attorney about litigation. That sounds like external evidence. What about A, pre-numbered purchase order forms prepared by the entity? That's something that's solely created by the entity itself, solely created by the entity. So that sounds like internal evidence, which is not quite as low as observation or inquiry, but is a lower level of internal evidence. So A is our answer. All right, moving on, 522. Audit evidence can come in different forms with different degrees of reliability, which of the following is the most persuasive type of evidence, all right? So same logic holds here. We want to talk about what uh, basis of what exists on that hierarchy. Uh, Maddie, what do you think is our answer here? You said, oh, go ahead. Yeah. So it's computations made by the auditor, which is our highest form of evidence. The auditor generated evidence, computations. That sounds like recalculation, which is one of our three forms, high forms of evidence. All right. So B is definitely our answer. All right. Moving to 24. The assurance bucket is filled with all of the following types of evidence except what? All right, so this is important to note. Remember what we're doing is we're gathering assurance over the course of the audit. And during each of the phases of testing, we get a little bit more information. So we talked about that. So we said the assurance bucket or the Chipotle burrito, whichever you prefer, okay? I know which one I prefer, which analogy I prefer. I don't know. Uh, but I, I say, I, I don't know if I prefer a bucket versus a Chipotle burrito anymore, you know, go to that age that I don't really eat burritos that much anymore, but still, you know, pretty delicious stuff. That being said, which are the items are going to be in that bucket or going to be in that burrito? Uh, Colin, what do you think? Uh, B. B, the audit report. Okay. So the audit report is the culmination of the work that the auditor performs. So that's external to it. That's what we use to actually, the audit, the insurance bucket is what we use to create the audit report. So it would not be part of the assurance bucket. So very good. All right. Current file of Verada's working papers generally include, if I'm going in alphabetical order, probably makes sense. I'm going to ask John next. Okay. So which one's going to be in the current file, John? Uh, C, a copy of the financial statements. Okay. Why is that in the current file? Uh, I said it's pretty straightforward that auditors should have a copy of the financial statements on hand. Yeah. If they're going to be auditing those financial statements for the current year, they probably want to have that in the current file. Okay. So the other one's flowchart of the accounting system, organization charts, copy of bond, bond and note and judgers. Do those change? Yes, but are they relatively constant? Relatively speaking, are they constant? Yes, okay. So they can change by a little bit, but they're not expected to change dramatically from year to year, whereas financial statements are different every single year. All right, that being said, we got the permanent file. Permanent file section of the working papers is kept for each shot client. The most likely contains an example of which document? Ellie, what do you think? D, narrative descriptions of the entity's accounting system and control procedures. Now, can their procedures, can their, their accounting system change? Yes, but is it relatively constant, like the examples we were talking about before? Absolutely, which is why D is our answer. Review notes, that's going to be for a current period under audit. Schedule a time spent on the engagement that talks about the current period engagement and correspondence with the entity's legal counsel. That would be a current period correspondence. So those would all be current file items. All right, uh, 29. The substantive analytical procedure known as trend analysis is best described by what? Matt F., what do you think? C, the examination changes in the trend. Okay, and that's just basically a description of trend analysis. So there's not really too much to explain there. So this is trend analysis, the actual definition. So yep, trend analysis is a trend analysis. That, that's all we have. All right, for the next one, I gave you two problems, but I'm going to merge these two problems together. So here's what we're going to do is we're gonna go over these, okay? We're gonna go over these and I'm gonna ask you a specific thing. So first of all, I'm gonna ask you what type of evidence is being gathered. So we have 10 types of evidence, you're gonna have to tell me that evidence. Then you're gonna tell me if it relates to account balances or transactions and events. So which category assertions and this was which assertion or assertion we're dealing with. So three things are gonna answer for me that's gonna answer all, all three questions. So type of evidence, category of assertion, which specific assertion or assertions are we dealing with? All right. So moving on, sending a written request to the entity's customers that uh, they report the amount owed to the entity. Dottie, what uh, what type of evidence is this? Sorry, Dottie. I didn't I couldn't see you over here, Dottie. Uh, so uh, confirmation, yes. Uh, account, uh, and, and, and is it account balances or transaction events? Account balances. Very good. And what assertion are we testing here? Yeah. All right. So 
That could be one of the assertions. Is that our primary assertion is the interesting question here, okay? So we said confirmation can test all assertions, and I don't disagree with you. I think the VA is one of the ones tested. What would probably be our primary assertion that we want to test in this situation? Existence, Existence occurrence, yes. So why do we say that? So we said that com uh, confirmations usually test uh, all assertions, but they test primarily completeness or existence occurrence. And I said, it really depends on what we're testing. If we're testing an asset, so accounts receivable, we're concerned about existence occurrence. Now, if I change this and I said vendors, would it still be existence occurrence? No, what would it be? Completeness, okay? Completeness goes opposite of existence occurrence, okay? Making sure that if they record an asset that it actually exists, making sure that if they have a payable that they recognize it, that they recognize their obligation. All right. Uh, all right. So having large sales and invoices for period two days before and after year and determine if they were recorded in the proper period. Uh, Rachel, what uh, type of evidence are we gathering here? Inspection of records. Yeah, sure sounds like accounting documents. So that sounds correct. Uh, what's our uh, ca category of assertions? Assertions about transactions. Yeah, so we're talking about invoices. Invoices are usually tied to a transaction or an event that occurs in the entity. So that's we're talking about assertions, transaction events. Uh, what assertion are we dealing with specifically? Cut off. So a period of two days before and after your end, remember, record it in the proper period. So dealing with cut off there. Very good. All right. Agreeing the total of the accounts receivable subsidiary ledger to the accounts receivable general ledger account. This one's a little bit tricky. So uh, AJ, what'd you come up with on this one for uh, the type of test that we're dealing with? I said inspection of records or documents. Yes, uh, I would agree with that. Is there another type of test that actually could be encompassed by this as well? Um, I, I do agree IRD is probably a default one. But if we're doing this as well, it sounds a little reperformance. Yeah, reperformance. Yeah. So you could also make an argument for a recalculation, um, but I think reperformance is a little bit more really close here because we're not actually recalculating numbers. We're agreeing, comparing the numbers to see if they match. Okay. So I think reperformance, but IRD is probably our default. Uh, what's our category of assertions, AJ? Account balance. Right. Because it says accounts receivable, which tells you an account balance in the financial statements. And uh, what assertion are we probably dealing with here? I said all. Oh, okay. So I think that uh, there's multiple assertions to be dealt with. I would agree with there's multiple assertions to be dealt with. But we're saying we're agreeing the total of the accounts receivable subsidiary ledger to the accounts receivable general ledger. It sounds like we're moving from a lower point in the records to a higher point in the records. In other words, we're moving from a lower point to a higher point or moving upward. What do we call that direction? That's tracing, that's moving the right direction. But what's tracing associated with? Is it? Completeness, yeah. You almost made me say it. <laughs> so completeness, yeah. It did default because somebody said, it. yeah, it's completeness. All right, discussing the adequacy of the allowance for doubtful accounts with a credit manager. Jordan, uh, what is our uh, type of evidence? Inquiry. Yes, that's an inquiry. And then uh, what category of assertion are we dealing with here? Account balances. Yes, and what assertion do we think that we're probably primarily focused on this one? Yeah, VAA. By the way, in this course, if you see allowance for doubtful accounts, if you see those words, you should automatically think VAA, all right? I will tell you, I, to my knowledge, every single question about allowance for doubtful accounts in this entire course, and most of the questions that are on like the CPA exam and other spots deal with the VAA. That seems to be always the default, is that number, is that uh, area being properly valued? So if you see allowance for doubtful accounts, just don't pay attention to any of the rest of the question and say, oh, it's got to be VAA. Then look if VAA is one of the answers and then you know what your default is, okay? Is it the right answer 100% of the time in all existence of human history? No, it's like 99.99998% of the time, okay? So comparing the current year gross profit percentage with the gross profit percentage in the last four years, uh, where are we at here? Kyle, uh, what, is our, uh, what is our test here that we're doing? Analytical procedure. Analytical procedure. What is our category of assertions? All right. And what assertion do we think we're testing here? VAA. VAA. Uh, by the way, uh, VAA is probably the most likely one in this scenario. Is VAA the only assertion we can test with analytical procedures? There's another one, and I told you guys to remember it. It's like 10% of the time we can do another one. Which one is it? How quickly we forget, like we go to sleep and then it just always just escapes our head. So analytical procedures primarily test VAA like 90% of the time. Sometimes they can test completeness, okay? That's the other situation. And we will see that in this course, which is why I keep reminding you of it. All right. Uh, examining new plastic extrusion machine to ensure the major acquisition was received. Uh, we got uh, CD, what do you think? CD. 
It's inspection of uh, a tangible asset. Yes, very good. Okay. Uh, what category of assertions are we dealing with? Um, the, the no, not, not, not what is it like? What, what is what category? Account balances or transactions and events? Um, the account balances. There we go. Yeah. All right. And what assertion are we testing here? Which specific assertion? Um, uh, Existence occurrence, yes, very good. Remember, expansion of tangible assets only test existence occurrence. Only test existence occurrence. Okay, so existence occurrence. Watching the entity's warehouse personnel count the raw materials inventory zero. What is our what type of evidence are we gathering here? Pardon? What type of evidence are we gathering? What is our procedure? Uh, see, oh, wait. Which one did we? Uh, G. So, so watching the observation. Uh, observation. Observation. Very good. Okay. Uh, what a category of assertion are we dealing with? Account balance. Count balances. Very good. And uh, what assertions are we testing here? I think the existence or confidence. I think both of those are being tested here. Yeah. We'll we'll actually validate that through our talk about inventory testing here in just a little bit. Okay. But yeah, it's uh, all those are correct. Related to this, we've got performing test counts of the personnel were out counter raw materials. Sounds like a very similar thing, but there's a small but very distinct change. Going back to the beginning, Juliet, what uh, type of test are we performing here? Is it still an observation? So that's yeah, reperformance, yes, because that word performing kind of gives us a clue. So this is a lot more powerful test. We're doing the work, not the client. All right. Now, uh, has anything else changed? Did uh, the category of assertions change? Yeah. No, did the uh, type of evidence or the assertions that we're gathering? Yeah. No, it's exactly the same otherwise, but it's a reperformance test as opposed to an observation test. So the change in the procedure changes the reliability there. Taking a letter from the entity's attorney indicating that there were no lawsuits in progress against the, against the entity. Okay. So, uh, Nick, what is our, uh, what is our uh, test here? What type of performance or to, what are we doing here? Um, I said observation. So, so if, we're retaining a, if we're retaining a letter from the entity's attorney, okay, entity's attorney is a third party. What's that? Confirmation. Yes, very good. Confirmation, very good. All right. And then uh, what uh, what category assertions are we dealing with? Um, I said transactions and events. So if we're talking about specific items, if we're talking about we're testing specific items, that would be a transactions and events. But in this case, we're asking a little bit more general information. Also remember, confirmations can only test account balances. So this would be a clue that this is account balances here. All right. And then uh, I'm going to save you on this one because this assertion is not immediately clear. If we're talking about lawsuits against the entity, most logically speaking, guys, what are we thinking about when we talk about lawsuits against the entity? So is our client going to want to record all those lawsuits saying, okay, well, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to be liable for this amount of money. Let's just throw that in the financial statements. We want to record all these lawsuits because that's what generally accepted accounting principles tells us to do. Is that the way most client, most businesses work? Is that what Dr. Shoney, I told you in 303 says, yeah, all, all businesses ever, all ever, they could record those contingent liabilities. You can trust them. They've all recorded all those contingent liabilities. Is that what he said? No, he said they had, they don't want to record those. Okay. They want to avoid recording contingent liabilities because that's an admission of guilt. But is our responsibility as auditors to make sure they record them? Yeah, and if we want to make sure they record something, that's a test of completeness. Yes, it's completeness, completeness assertion, making sure these things are recorded. Could we also want to make sure they recorded the appropriate amount? Yes, so VAA might also be relevant here. Had to go back and think about what happened in 303 to get the answers there. All right. Uh, I, I don't like this next one, so I'm going to do this one of on my own. Tracing the prices used by entities billing program for pricing sales invoices, the approved price list. So if they use tracing correctly here, this sounds like it's going to be completeness, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you guys a clue real quick. Don't ever take anything at face value when it comes to homework. This is not a tracing test, okay? Back to, Becker actually has an example of this in their CPA exam. They talk about tracing and the procedure they describe is actually a vouching test. And then they give in the solutions. The term is incorrectly used, but in common vernacular, tracing is often used to describe both types of tests, which kind of sucks. Why do they give you the two different terms if they're going to talk about them interchangeably? Mm -hmm. So you do have to be responsible to make sure that you look and see, is this truly a tracing test? And I'm telling you right now, it's not, okay? Technically speaking, this is probably more of a VAA test, which are looking at two documents and agreeing them to one another. That being said, uh, um, 
this is not really obvious as to which assertion is being tested, but it is very obvious this is an inspection of records and documents, and we're testing specific transactions because we're looking at pricing sales invoices, all right? So this is, again, probably VAA. You might make an argument for existence currents. It is definitely not completeness, regardless of the way, the way the fact that they say tracing there, which I keep this question in here because I like to point out the fact that tracing is not always appropriately used. I will not try to fool you on the exam because I know you've got plenty of stress on your own, but you do need to be responsible for that for the homework to make sure that you know that. Very good, guys. All right. Let's uh, go ahead and take a look at the analytical procedure. Let's see what we got here. Okay, I'm going to try to open this up. and. Uh, Okay, hold on just a moment. Give me a second. Talk amongst yourselves. Discuss your favorite management assertions. Download that. There's no way to hold on. I'm just going to do this. I apologize, guys. Y drive's not working right now, so that's why I'm having to go through this rigmarole. So. All right, guys. Let's go ahead and talk about this analytical procedure. Now, this analytical procedure was not easy, but there's a reason for that. There's a reason why we do that. It's because we're trying to identify, can we use analytical procedures in every situation? And we're going to come to a very unpleasant conclusion here. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about what's happening here. All right. So we've got Western Auditors for Western University. They're conducting their audit in the fiscal year ended December 31st, 2018. And uh, they've got a whole bunch of situations uh, with the football game. So they're trying to develop a revenue analytic. So... Sounds like a reasonable approach if they can actually come up with precise enough information. They've got seven games, seven home games that they're developing on. Four of these are regular games. Three of these are unique circumstances. So let's just go ahead and go through each of these and talk about how we're going to do it. We're going to calculate revenue for all of these different scenarios. So let's go ahead and talk about the default game. The default game is going to be listed up here as a daytime game. It's going to have 24,000 in attendance. They have prices of different ranges, box seats, end zone seats, upper deck seats, and the percentage of number of people. Now, it gets thrown a little bit of a caveat, which is, makes things really crazy, as they say. There's also free seats here that you have to account for. So those don't actually charge anything, but uh, you have to include them in the calculation to make sure that we get the number. So basically, you would have 17, sorry, 16,800, but you have to subtract out the 500 here to come up with a quantity of 16,300. So you add that all together, you get uh, a subtotal per game of $246,000 in revenue. For four of those games, that's 984,000, okay? So this is our baseline, and this is not a simple analytic by itself, but when they start throwing factors in here, it becomes challenging. And again, this was intentional. I gave you this question. The question is, is this gonna be on the exam, Dr. Barnes? The answer is no, I'm not gonna ask you anything quite this challenging, okay? But I did want you to give me your best effort on this. So nationally ranked opponent, what did they say about the nationally ranked opponent? They said that there's 30% more attendance, right? So we actually take, this 24,000, and we just time, multiply it times 1.3 to come up with a new number. They also charge 20% more for tickets for this one. So you basically do the same thing here. The distribution remains the same, but we still have those free seats we had to account for. So we come up with $385,920. All right. In-state rival, 20% more attendance. Also, they really decided to screw with you on this one, okay? Because they said those uh, seats that are going to be addition, which is going to be 4,800 seats, it's not evenly distributed out. 75% go into the box seats, and then another uh, another 20% uh, uh, or the rest of the 25% go into the uh, uh, upper deck. So they basically distribute that out and say, all right, 24,000 people are going to be in the box seats, which is basically our initial 16,300 plus, or 16,800 plus, the 75% uh, of the additional. So 24,000 and then 4,800 total. So we multiply these out. I think the prices remain the same. We come up with a quantity of 19,900, 4,800 and 3,600, come with 2,000, 95,200. If your numbers are a little bit different, do not panic here. Again, that's one of the reasons I grade on completion here rather than accuracy. Then for the evening game, they say evening games only have 95% attendance. So I have to multiply that times 95%. They also charge a little bit more for the evening games. So we had to add a 10% on there. 
Now, it's important to note that this 5% here, so this is an interesting thing. So I have actually argued with the publishers of the slides on this because they actually multiply this out and they say, okay, 5% uh, reduction, they actually reduce this to 475 seats, I believe. It's like, it's like, what's that? As it says that it is, does that? Okay. They may have added that note because I made that argument. And I, I'm, yeah. So I included the five, 500, but this number is a little bit off. And so uh, my number is going to be wrong here, if that's the case. But uh, I include the 500, which uh, does not include the projected 5% attendance, which I should account for. So I'm not always 100% correct, just like 99.9998% correct. All right. So yeah. So the number is going to be 1,921,860, according to my count. If you count it a little bit differently, you're going to be somewhere in that range, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Here's the deal. Regardless of this, if you got close enough to this number, we're comparing this to the actual revenue number. Now, what was their actual revenue recorded? Mm -hmm. 2,200,000, 2, okay? So what was our rule of thumb on calculating a tolerable difference here? Oops, 5%. So let's just go ahead and do that, okay? 2,200,000 times 0 0.05, 110,000. So we need to be within 110,000 of 2,200,000 for our expectation to work. Are we anywhere close? We are not, okay? So let's talk about some implications and some long-term picture things here. The reason why this, this question was given, why, why I assigned you such a difficult uh, question. Obviously, if you can answer something close to this question, then what you do on the exam shouldn't be a problem. But what is the implication of this? That's the most important question. We would have to go to the client and say, look, here's, we develop an expectation here. And what you give us, what you give us, this, this, the, the amount that you record as revenue is not close. So we need to understand why the amount that you gave us for revenue is not close to our expectation. We need to do more testing here. Now, that would be the ultimate conclusion. In general, when we talk about analytical procedures, that's going to be uh, our approach. If we utilize an analytical procedure, if the numbers are not close, we have to do additional testing. We'd like those numbers to be close. Like remember we did the bank interest expense on Wednesday. We said, this number's close. We can move on with our lives. No more testing to be done. That's what we're shooting for. That's why we do these analytical procedures. But in this situation, we're saying, yeah, we got more testing to do because we're not close. The question here I want to pose to you guys, is it a good idea to use an analytical procedure for something like revenues? Obviously not. We're using this situation. Uh, it's funny because if you take my graduate class, we actually do a revenue analytical procedure in there, which is a pretty good case, but uh, it's a lot got a lot more detail uh, associated with it. Um, but uh, as far as uh, our basic level, do we want to use an analytical procedure? And the interesting question is, why does an analytical procedure work in the first place? In the case of a reasonableness model and a reasonableness, uh, reasonableness model, when we've used this, we're trying to identify relationships between accounts. So think about what we already talked about. We talked about depreciation, doing a depreciation analytic. And I said, can we actually come up with an estimated depreciation expense based on the value of the asset, the useful life and the residual value? Yes. So we know there's a relationship between the value of an asset and de depreciation expense. What about the example we talked about on Wednesday? Is there a relationship between interest expense and another account? Yeah, that balance in the bank account, the line of credit. As long as we have that information, those relationships exist. Now, let's look at this situation. We're talking about sales revenue. Is there a relationship between sales revenue and another account in the balance sheet? And by the way, when I say relationship, you can say yes, because that's the correct answer. But I'm specifically more referring to, is sales revenue derived as, the, as a function of another account? No, sales revenue exists independently. That's how much sales we generate. Now, could we develop an expectation on it? Yes, but it would be very complex. It would have to take in all the factors that drive sales revenue. And it's very difficult to do. As you can see here, we put a whole lot of information here. We still weren't even remotely close. What would we have to do in this situation? We probably have to put in a lot more detail saying, okay, how many people actually showed up? How many ticket cancellations? Or we'd have to have a lot more information. At that point, it becomes more, or it becomes simpler for us to just test revenue directly. So this is an example of why would we test revenue analytic or an analytic use an analytic procedure to test revenue? It says if we think we can come up with a precise number based on estimates, we might utilize it, but it doesn't appear to have been a good idea in this scenario. It seems that there was just too much information excluded from our model. So analytical procedures, great, definitely not perfect. All right, let's go ahead and do some earthware stuff, shall we? All right. 
I really like this earthware exercise. I think this one and the one that we're going to do for chapter six are really good, are really good ways of making sure that you can uh, understand the content. So let's go ahead and I'm going to jump over WC inventory testing. All right. So what do you have to do here? What do you have to do here? So basically what you're going to do here in this specific particular situation is you are going to test these items here and you're going to enter the amounts that were called the quantity inventory tags on the inventory status report for one page. And then they flip them for the other page. They actually say, well, let's look at the status report and go to the count tags. And there were two locations. So you basically had eight tests that you were going to do. And uh, if you go back and you look at the information that was given, they actually had the status report, which is basically recording the number of the items. And they had the two locations, which is recording the counts. Now, before we start this, let's talk about the intuition that's going on here and why we're doing it in this way. First of all, this is not the auditor performing the counts. This is the client performing the counts and us observing that, which is not a bad test. We could perform test counts ourselves and get more information. If we perform the test counts ourselves, that's us performing those counts and we're probably doing uh, getting more detail. Now, it's important to note the auditor is never going to count 100% of the inventory. Well, I shouldn't say never. It's very, 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 very rarely, okay? Like if a client produces one asset or one, one inventory item in a year, they may test count that, okay? But uh, that would be like some like somebody who builds a skyscraper exclusively. It's like, okay, there's a skyscraper. All right, inventory count done. That was easy. All right. But for the most part, the auditor is never going to count all the inventory. They're going to count a sample of it. And we'll talk about sampling a little bit more in the next uh, in the next phase after the first exam. But uh, there's some counts here, and they were going through, and we're looking at some information, and we're trying to make some uh, associations. So the very first thing we note is that there were two work papers. And the work papers looked very similar, but there was a very, very important distinction. One started with the count tags and then moved to the status report, OK? The other one started with the status reports and then moved to the count tags. Now it sounds like that I'm I, I, I'm putting bringing this bringing this to to your attention because it sounds like it was deliberate, and it was deliberate. But we need to understand why that's deliberate. Okay, so they may want to guess why we have that deliberate uh, sequence. Like we start with one and move to the other. It's the whole thing about top to bottom versus bottom. Absolutely, it's directional testing. Okay. So if I'm starting with the count tags, so what is on the floor, the amount of inventory that was counted by the people who are doing the inventory count, and moving to the status report, which is basically the, the information that's recorded in our accounting or our client's accounting information system, I'm moving from source to record. I'm moving from bottom to top, which means we're testing what? Good. On the other hand, if I start with a status report, so the information that's in the system, and I move from the system, the record, and move down to the counts, which is what's on the floor, the source. I'm moving from record to source. I'm moving down. So that's a test of existence occurrence, okay? That's one of the things that you had to note as far with respect to describe any violations of management's assertions. Now, they're a little bit tricky on some of these. They're a little bit tricky on the way they approach these because this is one of these sets of assertions we can test. Obviously, if we see a violation here, this is a violation of completeness and this violation of existence occurrence, but there could be other violations based on the nature of information. We'll talk about those here in just a second. Okay. So I'm not going to put these into the spreadsheet because I'm in Google or I'm in, I'm in Google Sheets right now. And if I do this, it's going to actually modify my my the stuff on my Google Drive. But I am going to talk about the numbers here. And I want you guys to give me the numbers that you had here. All right. So uh let's go ahead. And again, this is all information from the documents had. So we start on the inventory count tags in the medium sweater, and then we move to the inventory status reports. Were there any differences between the quantities reported here? Okay, I'm not going to waste time with the ones that had any different quantities. I want to talk about the ones that were said. So we're good here. Okay, all right. What about this one figure for the Germany warehouse where we say uh, photo 11 by 17? Were there any differences here? Okay. So what did we have on the inventory count tags? Nine seven two. What's it? 9734. Okay. I had to say that out loud. Okay. All right. 9734. What do we have on the status report? Zero. Let's talk about that. Okay. Obviously, there's a disparity here, but what does it imply? All right. It implies that something was not recorded. So it's a violation of completeness. We have the completeness violation here. All right. We have our completeness violation. So describe any violation of management assertion. You're going to write over here completeness. Yeah. That's all there is to it. That's all. We violated completeness. Something that was on the floor did not get recorded. 
Yes, Jason. Uh, we haven't looked at the uh, information in the financial statement, so now there's no there's no presentation issue here. But a good question though. Moving down to Japan, for the medium sweaters, were there any issues here? This small slight issue. So what did it say for the quantity on the inventory count tags? 9687. 9687, and what does it say on the status report? 9687. Okay, this is interesting. So there's a difference in the recorded quantities. What does it sound like to you guys? Yeah, transposition error, okay, transposition error. So did the item get recorded? Yes, it did get recorded, okay? it's We did get recorded. We know that we have information in our system about it. Did it get recorded at the appropriate amount? All right, it did not, okay? So this is not a violation of completeness because completeness would say, did this get recorded at all? We do have a recording violation, but we're talking about getting recorded the appropriate amount. So if you're going to write the violation of the assertion, what are you going to say for this one? Yeah. VAA, there we go, evaluation, allocation, accuracy. That was what I was talking about. Then we can test multiple assertions, even though this is specifically focused on completeness. All right, any violations down here on photo 1117? I think we're good here. I've done this a few times before, so I should remember these. Okay. All right, moving over to our moving from status report to count tags, okay? For large t-shirts, were there any differences here? No. no. What about for briefcases? So we're all good here, okay? So we can move down to Japan. For large t-shirts, any issues here? Okay, so what's our quantity on the inventory status report? 2342, okay, what's the county on the count of the inventory? That's zero, okay, 2342. So let's think about what this implies, okay? I'm the auditor, I'm observing the inventory accounts, okay? Person says, okay, on my report here, it should say we have 2,342, you got that number right? Doesn't matter. All right, whatever the number is, we should have that in stock. We go to the place where it's in stock and there's a big blank space in the warehouse. It's like, we have a thief. <laughs> That's a possibility, actually, it's a possibility. But more appropriately, something's in our system. We've got an item, inventory items recorded in our system, but they're not in the warehouse, all right? And that's a violation of existence currents. And this is a very, very telling example because we walked out there and said, oh, inventory doesn't exist. A very, very obvious, tangible example. Inventory doesn't exist. Is everybody clear on the difference here? So this is, this is I really, re, the reason I really like this exercise is because sometimes telling the difference between completeness and existence occurrence can be a challenge. This is a very telling and tangible example of how you tell the difference between those two and how we actually test those as auditors. Now, will every example be as easy as this? Unfortunately, no. We're gonna run into a little bit more challenging ones later on. But I want you to think back to this when you're having trouble remembering, uh, trying, to, trying to figure out the difference between completeness and existence occurrence. That directional test and the nature of the testing that we're performing will give you a big clue in that. And that's really important, especially as we start moving forward in this course to be able to understand the difference. And I think the briefcase down here is the same. It doesn't have any issues. Am I correct about that? Okay. So we only had those three issues. Also, is everybody clear when we talked about the difference uh, VAA issue right there, why that's not a violation of completeness, but why it's a violation of VAA? Same thing would be held true here. So if we had numbers that were different, but there was just like a recording error, that would be a violation of a different assertion. So be able to tell the difference on that based on the results of our testing is really important. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we're done here. So I'll give you guys a little 10 minute extra break. Spend that extra 10 minutes contemplating auditing over your weekend. Okay. <laughs> Just joking. Uh, I'll see you guys for the exam review on uh, Monday. <laughs>